My name is Vince Cerf. I'm uh, Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google, uh, but a long time ago I served as a Program Manager at uh, ARPA. It's my distinct honor and pleasure uh, to introduce our next speaker. I, I want to draw your attention to uh, a special bill in 1991 that almost everyone in this room remembers as the Gore Bill, the High Performance Computing and Communications Act of 1991, which also uh, was the entity that helped create uh, NIDR D and its purpose. And it was Al Gore who uh, introduced all of that uh, to our uh, history. Uh, he also was an active participant in promoting uh, internet. Uh, you'll recall uh, Net Day that John Gage and others were uh, so actively pursuing that uh, there are photographs of Vice President Gore and President Clinton installing ethernet cable. This was at a time when wireless wasn't yet as well developed as it is now. And so they were stringing the country together uh, with ethernet cable. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, offering to Vice President Gore a uh, Webby Award in 2005. Uh, and his, you know, the Webbies only allow you five word responses. And his was absolutely dramatic. He said, please don't recount this vote. This is one of the more memorable Webby responses that I recall. And then, of course, in 2007, uh, after uh, the production of that wonderful film and book, The Incon An Inconvenient Truth, he won an Oscar for that, and then in that same year uh, shared the Nobel Peace Prize well, with the uh, International Committee on Climate Change. So I have to say that, you know, how could one introduce this man? All I can say to you is that patience and persistence have really been his hallmark. But the thing I want to remember most, Vice President Gore, is a 1986 hearing uh, that my colleague Bob Kahn attended. And in that hearing, Bob introduced the term national information infrastructure, but it was the question at the end of the hearing that launched so much of what all of us have experienced Vice President Gore, then Senator Gore, said, would it be a good idea to hook all the supercomputer, uh, supercomputers that NSF is funding together with an optical fiber network? That was the question. Uh, and it caused about 150 of us to run off the next year in February to San Diego and spend three days figuring out what became the National Research and Education Network plan. And so that is the thing that I remember the most. I also recall that even before that meeting, Vice President Gore, then Senator Gore, spoke about the information superhighway, and we're now living that vision. I give you Vice President Gore. Thank you very much, Van, and ladies and gentlemen, it's a, a great, great pleasure and a great honor uh, to be here with you today and to all who uh, envisioned and organized this event, uh, let me tell you how grateful I am to be able to participate in it. Over these uh, many years, uh, Vint has become a, a very close uh, personal friend and we've shared a lot of trips and social events together and uh, just uh, at the early part of the lunch, I was uh, feeling a sense of joy when I was uh, sitting between uh, Vin and Bobby Kahn. Uh, it was like uh, old times, and uh, uh, it really, uh, it's, it's uh, so much fun uh, to see so many uh, good friends here. And uh, earlier he had to leave, but I, I want to acknowledge Mike Nelson. He uh, is teaching a class right now, and they may be uh, watching over the internet. I know that they are watching the event. I just don't, don't know if he's gotten back from here to there by now. But he was my uh, principal staffer during several of the years that I had the privilege of working on um, the information superhighway. And thank you for using that phrase, uh, Vint. Uh, there are, well, Vint, to caution me not to try to uh, acknowledge the distinguished guests who are present because there are so many, uh, and indeed there are. So uh, please forgive me for not uh, running through the list who should be each uh, individually uh, acknowledged, but 
please know that uh, my heart is full uh, uh, seeing so many old friends and knowing that many others are uh, watching uh, by, by means of the, uh, the, the uh, web feed uh, today. Um, <coughs> those of you here and those who are not here but uh, connected to us played uh, such an incredibly important role in creating the technologies that now underpin the digital economy and all of the developments that have transformed uh, our, our lives uh, on every continent here on this planet. Uh, and it, it was such a great privilege to have the opportunity to learn from you and to work with you. Uh, thank you. The, the phrase doesn't really uh, summon all the emotion that is behind it. The technologies uh, and the visions that you helped to develop have, uh, of course, created hundreds of millions of jobs around the world in just the past 20 years. It, it's almost impossible to uh, overstate the significance of, of what you were able to, uh, to bring about. The Internet, high-performance computing, software, and algorithms, and most importantly, the people who know how to build them and use them are the key to understanding and addressing so many of the challenges that we now face, from solving the climate crisis to uh, revolutionizing and fixing the educational system, making democracy work the way it is supposed to work, improving the cost effectiveness uh, of our health care system, and so many more things that are, that are crucial uh, to life in the, in the 21st century. Um, again, I will not try to single out the individuals who played such crucial roles in the research uh, and development programs that we're celebrating today. Uh, many have uh, spoken and will speak on the program. Uh, many have been acknowledged with awards that are so well deserved, but many others are not well known, even within the technology community. And I want to, uh, uh, to say thank you to, to all of them. Uh, it's due in part uh, to the fact that some of the most critical players were, uh, to use a phrase, faceless government bureaucrats, uh, as Fox News might uh, call them. But uh, uh, I, I would say uh, quite simply that uh, as individuals and as a group, you are true heroes. Those of us uh, who were privileged to have worked with you, uh, to have worked with the key government technologists uh, involved, we know the crucial role played by uh, all of you. And, and again, uh, you deserve the thanks uh, of literally billions uh, of people. The government managers uh, and executives who worked with academics, uh, industry leaders, nonprofit groups, and others to pass the High Performing Computing Act and to build the organizations that implemented its vision are among the true unsung heroes of this story. You were creative and are creative visionary, risk-taking professionals, and such a pleasure uh, to work with. Everyone who's ever opened a browser or used uh, the Internet or enjoyed its fruits owes you a great debt. So I am here today primarily to, to say thank you. I also thought I might take a little time uh, to look back and share some of the uh, the lessons that I learned from working on legislation and programs related to technology and describe uh, at the end very briefly some of the uh, initiatives that I've been involved in since I left the White House. I'm a recovering politician now uh, on about step nine, uh, and <laughs> the chances of a relapse have been diminishing uh, exponentially. Uh, <laughs> And I'll, uh, I'll end by sharing uh, some hopes for the future of what we uh, used to call uh, the information infrastructure. I guess we still use that phrase. During the decade uh, prior uh, to the time I introduced the high-performance 
Computing Act in late 1988, I held uh, many long discussions with some of the people in this room. Uh, you taught me a great deal about the technologies uh, later covered in the legislation and about their potential. After the bill was introduced, it took more than three years uh, to pass it, so we had uh, ample time for more discussions and hearings, uh, and they filled my imagination with the possibilities for our collective future. At the time, uh, very few people were paying attention. Uh, when I had uh, the, the first hearings uh, about uh, the Internet in the 1980s, Almost no one was in the audience aside from some immediate family members of the witnesses. The, uh, <laughs> the only other legislator there was a Republican uh, minder sent to make sure I didn't cause trouble, <laughs> as I had already acquired a reputation for doing. <laughs> At the time, a good connection uh, to what most people didn't even call the Internet yet, uh, I, I remember uh, when Bill Gates published a book in 1995, uh, The Road Ahead, and the word Internet didn't appear anywhere in it. Uh, but a few people uh, had begun to use uh, the word. Uh, but at that time, a good connection ran at about 1,200 baud. And uh, the backbone of the entire NSF net, the seed crystal around which the commercial Internet would eventually grow, had a top speed equal to a high-speed telephone modem. Back then, a 56K connection seemed like uh, Arthur C. Clarke's phrase, when technology is sufficiently advanced, it seems like magic. It's indistinguishable from magic. That's, that was the category 56K was in back then. A 2 megabit connection was something uh, for the far distant, uh, fantastical future. What's interesting, though, uh, and was to me at that time, and is even more so now looking back, is how many people in this room were actually able to forecast pretty accurately how the technology would evolve. Most of us uh, are challenged by exponential curves, but some of you uh, could see into the future, and I'm so grateful for your willingness to, to share that vision with me. We already knew about Moore's Law and its awesome implications, and that concept, along with other information, made it abundantly clear that the power of supercomputers would increase uh, with amazing rapidity. Unlike most uh, in the general public, our witnesses understood the likely impact of exponential technological change in information science particularly if these machines could be connected to one another. There's a wonderful book from Lee Rainey at the Pew Internet and American Life Project and colleagues at Elon University called Imagining the Internet, which looked back at the predictions uh, about the Internet made uh, 20 years ago. What's striking to me is how much the technology forecasters got right and how much the consensus that existed in the 1980s about what would be possible by the year 2000 uh, and the year 2012 turned out to be uh, surprisingly on target. Even back uh, in the 1980s, we understood that the speed of networks would grow from kilobits to megabits to gigabits. Uh, when I introduced the bill, we purposely put in uh, the goal of creating a gigabit network. We knew the cost of storage and supercomputing would plummet quickly, and we understood that we'd soon have more information than we'd know what to do with. Uh, back in the late 70s, I tried to coin a, coin a word that didn't ever caught on called exformation, uh, meaning all of the information that exists in abundance outside the conscious awareness of any uh, human brain. But it sloshes around out there causing uh, uh, our... Uh, well, I'm trying to shift to a ship metaphor uh, to, to kind of knock things off track, even if we don't know what the, uh, what's, what's, what's in it. Um, now, uh, there's a whole new industry called big data, 
uh, that's uh, growing by leaps and bounds, though not quite as quickly as the volume of data it is growing. What we could not entirely forecast was all the ways in which the power of information technology would be used, how many uh, industries, businesses, uh, life patterns, and habits would be disrupted. In 1988, everyone thought a web was something a spider made. Netscape, eBay, Amazon, uh, uh, and others uh, hadn't been launched, and e-commerce was just a, a concept. At the time, the Internet was restricted to research use. We knew that it would unleash creativity on an unprecedented scale, but we didn't fully imagine Angry Birds, <laughs> uh, much less Facebook and Twitter and uh, all the rest. And we certainly did not imagine all the impact that new Internet applications would have on our daily lives. Back in the 1960s, I had had the good fortune uh, as a college student to immerse myself in information theory and technology and its relationship to public policy. Uh, when I was a senior that year, I wrote my thesis on the impact of television on the American constitutional system. Now, the Internet is changing what citizens expect from their governments, although I might say uh, in uh, just re re recapping a brief uh, conversation we had over lunch, that even with all of the excitement about the Internet and the obvious uh, uh, disruptions uh, from Tahrir Square to Occupy Wall Street, it's worth remembering that television is very sticky. Uh, our brains have a kind of television receptor uh, our ancestors on the savannah a million years ago, sitting around uh, in a circle, when the leaves move, the ones that didn't look are not our ancestors. Uh, and the ones that did pass that trait down. And when there is sudden movement in our field of vision, the amygdala uh, forces us to look. It's a survival uh, response that's hardwired, and television activates that uh, on an average about once a second. Uh, and television still dominates our political system, and it has been extremely harmful to our political system. The public square in which uh, uh, the conversation of democracy takes place used to have low entry barriers. It was freely accessible. And individuals, an adult can learn to read and write in two weeks. And uh, after Gutenberg, by the millions from northern Europe progressing south, uh, people became literate. It's a Eurocentric story, but replicated elsewhere. And the Enlightenment emerged from the creation of a public square in which individuals could freely take part, not only gaining access to the knowledge that had been previously restricted to elites, but also by contributing their own ideas, which would find an audience or not. And when it did, in the manner of a Google search, uh, uh, growing numbers attracted to a set of ideas would attract still more. When Thomas Paine walked out uh, of his front door in Philadelphia, uh, there were a dozen low-cost print shops within five square blocks. But the public square began to change dramatically when, in the early 1960s, television's audience eclipsed those reading newsprint. And now the dominance is so complete that 80 percent of the uh, money raised by political candidates in both major political parties go to purchase 30-second television advertisements. And that means that the public square is no longer freely accessible. There are gatekeepers that charge tolls. If Thomas Paine walked out of his front door today to the nearest television station in Philadelphia or a few blocks further to Comcast, the leading provider of television programming in the United States, and announced that he had just completed uh, common sense and was ready to present it on television, uh, 
he would be laughed off the premises unless he had several million dollars uh, to pay the rent required for access to the modern public square. The Internet is beginning to change that and will eventually disrupt it. But because of the stickiness of the television medium and because of the continuing mismatch between the creation of content and the ability to send it over networks, witness that video is the limiting application uh, on networks today. Uh, and even though millions are viewing video uh, over the uh, Internet, still television is completely dominant. The average American watches it five hours per day. And somebody's making up for us. Uh, and, 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 and because they watch it five hours a day, our politicians have to spend five hours a day begging special interests for money in order to pay the rents, in order to communicate with the, with the mass public in the medium that truly matters. But as we have seen, younger people are turning to the Internet in larger numbers. Though 75% of those who use the Internet are still watching television while they use the Internet. In any case, um, we could not have uh, foreseen the potential, some of it yet to be realized, such as the democratizing influence of the Internet on our uh, political system. Uh, by the way, the architecture, the social architecture of the Internet in many ways ironically mimics the social architecture of the print revolution in the sense that it has low entry barriers. Individuals can both gain and contribute knowledge to the public square thus formed. Already it's no accident that all of the reform movements and disruptive calls for change that challenge the power of legacy corporations and political structures exist on the Internet. That is where democracy lives today. So I'm very hopeful that this change will continue uh, to evolve. But so many sectors of our economy have already been transformed utterly by the Internet, from trading stocks to book sales to music. You all have your own lists. Uh, we didn't Imagine how Twitter and smartphones and the web, uh, along with satellite uh, television, could empower the brave people who overthrew their failing governments in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya. In retrospect, it was a blessing that back in 1988, almost no one was paying attention to what we were doing or fully understood the onrushing impact of the Internet uh, and high-performance computing. If they had, we would have had to fend off efforts to contain or constrain the power of those emerging digital technologies and the ability to undermine old business models. I remember vividly a meeting that I asked for uh, in the late 1970s with the last CEO of what we then called Ma Bell. Uh, it's hard to imagine that Ma Bell was still uh, in existence in the late 1970s, but it was. And uh, I'll tell you a very uh, a quick story. I grew up uh, in and around uh, in this city uh, for a large part of my life dividing my time between here and Tennessee. But my father was a congressman, and when I was four years old, he was elected to the United States Senate. And in a process that as a father and grandfather, I now understand quite well, he frequently uh, solved his work-life balance problems by taking me with him uh, to his uh, subcommittee and committee hearings. Uh, and. In the mid-1950s, when I was uh, five and six years old, uh, he chaired uh, the subcommittee of the Senate uh, Public Works and Transportation Committee, 
and was the author of the Interstate Highway Bill. Uh, as a soldier in World War II, he had seen uh, the Autobahn, and I remember vividly uh, as, a, as a young boy when we were driving between our farm in Carthage, Tennessee, to the city of Nashville, he would point to the endless uh, stream of red taillights uh, on uh, Highway 70 in front of us and the endless stream of headlights coming in the opposite direction. And he told my sister and me that it didn't used to be that way, but after World War II, uh, the sales of automobiles and pickup trucks had gone through the roof, and the little two-lane roads that had been uh, built in an earlier era were no longer sufficient to carry the volume of traffic that was now crowding into them. Uh, and he wrote and sponsored the Interstate uh, Highway Act. I remember as a young boy w how fascinated I was when these uh, grown men who were senators raised their hands to vote on what color the signs should be on the Internet. I remember the debate on whether they should be white with black print or red to stand out, uh, or green, which was eventually the choice. I remember when one of my father's uh, colleagues, a senator from North Dakota, who I should not name, uh, made an impassioned argument that uh, they were wasting money by designing the, uh, the, the, the lanes that, of the superhighway to be twice as wide as the width of a car. Why not make it uh, just the width of the car and save uh, on the expense of all that uh, asphalt and concrete? And others uh, patiently went through uh, the physics of driving an automobile <laughs> and how it was very difficult to keep it narrowly within such a small space. That made an impression on me, but not as much as the impression I gained during our uh, six times a year trips back and forth in the car, all of us packed into an old Chevrolet uh, from Washington, D.C. to Carthage, Tennessee. Uh, and every trip in the uh, 50s, uh, the, the time of the trip took less because more of the interstate highway system was built. And we'd have to... We'd run into the, uh, oh, what do you call them, the steamrollers uh, and the gravel, and then we'd have to get off and find our way back to the old two-lane road and maybe another 50 miles down. We'd get another little stretch that was under construction, and before too long, the entire thing had been built. And what, what had been a two-day trip became a one-day trip. Well, uh, when I went to the House of Representatives. I, I chaired a group called the Congressional Clearinghouse on the Future, which was a glorified uh, speakers bureau. But boy, we had, uh, we had wonderful uh, speakers, Buckminster Fuller and Ilya Prigogine, and oh gosh, I could go through the list. I, I, I was fascinated. And those who were conversant with what was going on in the computer revolution made me aware of what came to be called Moore's Law. The term was already beginning to be used. And the mismatch between the exponential growth in information processing and the stasis of a nationwide communications network that had been optimized for Alexander Graham Bell's uh, uh, telephone uh, uh, system, uh, twisted copper pairs, was exactly analogous to that stream of taillights and headlights on a two-lane road network. And so the metaphor information superhighway really came uh, from that analogy. And I asked for uh, some meetings, and that led to uh, the meeting with the CEO of AT&T, Ma Bell. Charles Brown was his name. And I sketched out for him how exciting and valuable and important it would be for the United States of America to develop an information superhighway. 
And I was uh, naively shocked to, as it dawned on me during the conversation that not only was he not excited about this proposition, he had significantly negative interest uh, in this proposition. And I was reminded of that by the reference to the fact that we were blessed that the powers that be did not know what you all knew when, when this uh, discussion and later the hearings began. One CEO that I met with uh, in 1980 was excited about it, the CEO of Corning Glass. In any case, uh, what I learned um, during those sessions with the uh, visionary thinkers and the Congressional Clearinghouse on the Future sessions proved extremely useful in helping me to understand what so many of you uh, made me aware of. And later, in starting work on the High Performance uh, Computing Act, it enabled me to be a little more effective in trying to articulate a vision of how computer technology and high-speed networks could improve the lives of every American. I know my staff got sick and tired of that phrase, the information superhighway, and the story I always told about the proverbial little girl in Carthage, Tennessee, my hometown, who would come home from school and plug into the Library of Congress digitally. But that simple story, for me, uh, helped make real the potential for voters who would have to pay for the federal programs necessary to fund the early development of the supercomputing and networking technologies that you all uh, are discussing and recognizing today. Back when the legislative hearings uh, began, the idea was, I know it sounds quaint and old-fashioned uh, in this day and time, but the idea was that Democrats and Republicans could work together in the Congress and with the White House to coordinate the various computing and networking research programs that were scattered all around the federal agencies and in the process accelerate the development of the Internet and the information technology industry. It wasn't easy. And I didn't have many fans in the Bush White House, maybe a few more than in the second Bush White House. But, but uh, in any case, my legislation did have the support of some CEOs beyond the CEO of uh, Corning Glass. Uh, it had the support of the Internet Society and the rest of the Internet technology community and of educators and academic researchers, the library community located in every city and town in the United States, and thousands of computer geeks around the country. Don't, don't underestimate the computer geeks uh, around the country. Uh, it's, maybe it's a pity we didn't have Facebook and Google Plus uh, back then. It might have been easier to mobilize support for the bill. But what was most interesting was how so many of you made it possible to quietly work with the various federal agencies that were cobbling together the different pieces of the high-performance computing and communications program, even though the Republicans in the West Wing didn't necessarily think it was good politics to support a bill introduced by a Democrat. But in particular, Dr. Alan Bromley, President uh, George H.W. Bush's science advisor, uh, had made expanding federal uh, efforts in this area a, a high priority. And he was pleased uh, to see the Congress supporting efforts to win increased funding for R&D uh, in this area. In retrospect, uh, it, it really was uh, perhaps better that it took more than three years to pass the, the act because uh, we did keep on holding uh, hearings and the press uh, kept writing articles, and senators and congressmen kept hearing about the importance of networking and supercomputing. That's not to say that it wasn't extremely frustrating to 
see the bill tied up in uh, intercommittee jurisdictional fights and delays due to silly debates about uh, whether the high performance computing program should have a legal requirement to buy only uh, components made in the United States from chips made only in the United States. No one's ever written the definitive history uh, of the legislation, and maybe no one ever will, uh, that created the National uh, IT R&D Organization. But it would be an interesting case study. The legislation went through many dozens of drafts, and at one point the Senate Energy Committee, I recall, introduced a version that put the Department of Energy in charge of everything, and that almost gave me a heart attack uh, at a young age. But the final legislation did provide a clear vision and required that the agencies do something that was so somewhat unnatural, work together effectively, plan their budgets in a coordinated way, and share computing resources. Equally important, the legislation established a high-level advisory committee to guide the high-performance computing and communications program. Well, the bill was passed just over 20 years ago at the end of 1991. Fortunately, it got done before election year politics made bipartisan cooperation even harder. Uh, the elder President Bush held a very nice signing ceremony for the bill, and several computer industry CEOs and members of Congress were there. Unfortunately, the White House schedulers didn't include the author of the bill, but that's okay. Uh, I got to go to a great many signing ceremonies after Bill Clinton and I got elected to, to the White House the following year. What finally ensured that the bill passed is that all the key players adopted Harry Truman's famous motto, and I quote, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. Incidentally, he said that while he was serving as vice president. Um, <laughs> As important as the direct impact of the High Performance Act and the NIDRD have been, all the plans made and the projects funding, the funded, uh, the indirect impact is greater still. Both the legislation and uh, the HPCC program raise the profile of computer and networking research. Uh, when we were at the White House, we often pointed to the program and the huge return on the public's investment that it generated as a premier example of how government can indeed serve as a catalyst to spark private sector innovation and investment. I don't know if there have been very many other success stories with as much such impact. In that way, the program was much like the first White House uh, website, which we launched about a year and a half after inauguration. Uh, I remember uh, when uh, Katie Couric, then a co-host at the Day Show, came into my office in the West Wing for a live interview, and I said, Katie, this is called the World Wide Web. You're going to be hearing a lot about this. Really, what is that? Uh, and uh, <laughs> we started uh, uh, WhiteHouse.gov, which had a pretty powerful demonstration effect, and we were recalling how uh, we certainly advised uh, the, the, the folks at the White House to purchase WhiteHouse.com, <laughs> but WhiteHouse.com at the time was owned by uh, uh, a man named White, uh, who was a gun dealer in North Carolina, and uh, Jesse Helms' uh, home state. And uh, the political uh, types at the White House figured that they did not want to get into a protracted negotiation with him. But WhiteHouse.com had stuck in my mind, and I, I debated whether to tell this story. Vince said, go ahead and tell it. <laughs> but uh, uh, there were a lot of initiatives during those years. One of them was called the, the E-Rate. Uh, and uh, I advocated the connecting of all schools and libraries in the country to the Internet. Well, how to pay for it? Well, my friend Reed Hunt, uh, my high school classmate uh, who 
uh, turned out to be chairman of the FCC, uh, was instrumental in helping come up with uh, an initiative that uh, charged an extra fee that went into uh, the Universal Access Fund, originally set up to connect rural uh, users uh, to the telephone system, uh, and to use that revenue to connect all the schools and libraries. And uh, the, my opponents in the Republican Party uh, seized upon this and labeled it the Gore Tax uh, until they realized how dang popular it was. And that phrase uh, mercifully disappeared from the public uh, discourse. But in the course of promoting the E-rate, I went to an elementary school that was one of the ones advanced in putting computers in the classroom. And all the students had their own terminals, and the teacher had a terminal at the front of the room. And I walked in and was talking to them and uh, mentioned uh, the White House website. And I said, here, let me uh, show you. Well, by then, oh. Some of you have been watching the wrong kind of websites. <laughs> but the gun shop had sold it, had sold WhiteHouse.com, and I accidentally typed in WhiteHouse.com, and har hardcore porn showed up on all. Uh, and I up, 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 and uh, luckily it was only up for about a half a second before I pressed on that little X. Boy, I had to find that X pretty quickly. <laughs> but... Yeah, um, in any case, uh, this has been uh, uh, a, a, a quite uh, a journey. Uh, and every federal agency uh, got on to uh, the .gov uh, sites, and state governments and then city governments uh, did, uh, and businesses uh, began to do it in much larger percentages. The demonstration effect from the National Research and Education Network to, to WhiteHouse.gov to the E-rate and the rest played a, a very large role in, I think, accelerating the adoption of the Internet. And by showing how researchers could use supercomputers, visualization, analytical software tools, online collaboration, then the web, high-speed networks, this legislation, the Act, showed CEOs, investors, and the general public what was possible. The other long-term impact of this program uh, that cannot be underestimated really comes back to the people involved in it. How many people in this room had, their, had part of their education funded by programs under NIDRD and its predecessors or have gotten funding for graduate students now working in your labs? The technologies and tools and infrastructure built with federal research uh, provides huge payoffs. But the students who know how to create and use these technologies, many of them become the entrepreneurs, the CIOs, the developers, uh, the leaders in many fields who apply these technologies in ways that have beneficial impacts on everyone. In spite of the, the, the many uh, things that I was asked to do when I was Vice President in the White House, I always focused on the implementation of this act uh, and the pursuit of its goals. I had weekly coordinating meetings in my office uh, in the West Wing. We set up the President's IT Advisory Committee, or PTAC, which brought together an amazing group of technology experts from academia, corporations, and elsewhere. That they not only guided the HPCC program, they provided advice on everything from open source software to computer science education uh, to the continuing evolution of supercomputers and helped shape computing programs throughout the federal government. We made a real effort to ensure that the, that the findings and the talent in the high perfu performance computing program were applied in as many areas as possible. As some of you remember, we published the National Information Infrastructure Report uh, soon uh, after the Clinton-Gore administration began. A couple of years after getting to the White House, we published the Global Information Infrastructure Report. I remember going to uh, uh, international meetings uh, 
I introduced that report at one in uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, we developed the White House e-commerce strategy. In every case, the experts from the High Performance Computing and Communications Program were central to providing advice and guidance on how to do it in the most uh, valuable and effective way. By the final year uh, of that administration, the U.S. was the undisputed world leader in supercomputing. We had a multi-year lead over any other nation in advanced networking. I was extremely proud of the role that the federal government played in supporting the researchers and private companies that made this possible. When I left uh, government, uh, I decided to continue uh, working in this space in the private sector. Uh, my work on the board of Apple and as a senior advisor to Google allowed me to continue learning uh, and working. And the excitement of those uh, earlier days uh, continues for me uh, right now. Uh, and our ability uh, to use the tools that have come out of this revolution to address problems in dire need of solution is one of the most exciting things of all uh, for me. Uh, many of you know that I spend the majority of my time working on solutions to the climate crisis and advancing awareness of why we have to make it our top priority uh, globally. To solve this crisis, we have to use uh, information technology in new uh, and exciting ways. We have the ability now to continuously monitor the earth and give people uh, a real-time view of what is happening with global warming. Uh, I've worked for many years to try uh, to improve the government's use of information technology to give us the information that can help us solve this crisis. The ability of advanced computers to integrate, process, uh, display, and empower the visualization of complex data sets is bringing about a dramatic change in our capacity to understand phenomena that we have never before grasped. Uh, the exciting new developments in artificial intelligence, uh, always hyped but uh, with a reality that is uh, slowly uh, catching up to the hype. I, uh, some of you know about the uh, Eureka program where vast quantities of data describing uh, mysterious uh, phenomena in physics are plugged into the program, uh, which will then sometimes uh, derive new, previously unknown laws of physics that are still difficult for any human being to comprehend, but which do actually work. Uh, the Turing test may not uh, be passed in our lifetimes. Uh, there's a famous bet uh, between Ray Kurzweil and Mitch Kapoor uh, on that uh, subject. And I, I kind of side with Mitch uh, on that. But already uh, we are seeing uh, new uh, frontiers being explored that are even beyond the ones that you all imagined uh, back uh, in the early days when this uh, act was being put together. Um, this computing power must be applied to solve the, cl the climate crisis. Um, I've done my best to try to communicate effectively about this uh, challenge. And at the same time, I've also uh, tried to continue reaching out to young people about the advantages of supercomputing and networking. I've had the privilege of working with Vint on a, uh, a week-long gathering of young people in California under the auspice of something called the Campus Party that believes uh, that uh, the Internet I is a network of people, not machines. And I like that uh, phrase. And along with Tim Berners-Lee, uh, Vint and I have participated in many uh, of these events in Brazil, Mexico, Latin America, and uh, elsewhere. Um, I've also uh, enjoyed uh, going to gamification events recently uh, and, and learning about the developments in this uh, incredible uh, new field. I mentioned Angry Birds earlier, but boy, uh, what's going on with the gamification of sites uh, throughout the Internet uh, is, is quite uh, spectacular. 
So let me close by spending uh, just a, a couple more minutes uh, on the future. In spite of the exciting days that you all are uh, remembering here with this event and the anniversary that you are uh, acknowledging here, there are, of course, uh, even larger problems uh, that lie ahead, including uh, but not limited to the climate crisis. And NIDER D continues to have an absolutely critical role to play. Uh, Twenty years ago, at the time this act uh, passed, uh, I used to uh, talk a lot about how we needed the tools to gather data, squeeze it into information, distill it into knowledge, and ferment it into wisdom. Uh, one day, Mike Nelson said, you know, that sounds suspiciously like the recipe for Jack Daniels uh, whiskey. <laughs> but uh, the metaphor was, uh, this metaphor was not original uh, with, with me, but it is a, a, a pretty good metaphor. And I think we're doing a pretty good job with the first two parts of that recipe. We've got lots of data, uh, more than we can handle, and we have powerful tools for analyzing it and deriving meaning. But we still have lots of work to do to turn information into knowledge and ferment it into wisdom. I'm particularly pleased in that regard to see the National Science Foundation's new initiative on discovery informatics to explore new modes for machine learning, automatic fact checking, hypothesis testing, and other ways to combine and validate information. A related grand challenge is finding better ways to harness the wisdom of the crowd online. Crowdsourcing, of course, works better for some problems than others, but we need better ways to use social media and other collaborative technologies to pull out the nuggets and share them with one another. And we need to do it efficiently so the people with the best brains uh, and often the least time can join in collaborative projects. Somebody said uh, that uh, anybody who's ever been on an online forum knows that the people with the least to say often have the most time to say it. Uh, too many blogs and discussion lists are clogged with the trivial, not to say the vitriolic. We see organized uh, distribution denial of discourse attacks to close down useful efforts to foster dialogue. And of course, we also have a surplus of garden variety denial particularly denial of science and denial, denial of realities like the climate crisis. One problem that we face today is that a little bit of misinformation can be amplified and disseminated to millions of people in minutes. In chapter 10, verse 6 of Ecclesiastes, uh, the verse says, a little stupidity can cancel out the greatest wisdom. There are certainly lots of examples. Obama was born in Kenya. Global warming is a hoax, etc. If we are lucky, the truth will eventually reach all who want to learn it. But as a football coach, Darrell Royal once said, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So we have more work to do, more preparation to do, if the Internet is truly going to be more self-correcting. We don't want anyone put in charge of filtering out falsehood according to his or her interpretation. That's neither possible nor desirable. But we do need better ways to share high-quality information. Wikipedia is a step in the right direction, but much more uh, is needed. Incidentally, uh, uh, who's our friend who uh, came up with Wikipedia? Uh, Jimmy Wales. Uh, was telling me he was stopped at, by a customs agent uh, at, uh, uh, when he was entering Europe uh, last year. And uh, the, uh, the, the man said, uh, why, are, why are you visiting Spain? He said, business. And he said, what is your business? He said, I invented Wikipedia. And uh, he said the customs agent looked at him and said, yeah, sure, you and Al Gore. <laughs> It, it only hurts when you laugh. <laughs> there are more social problems than technological problems, and they are genuinely hard problems. Similarly, finding ways for people from different cultures who speak different languages to work effectively together online.
can enable innovators in every corner of the world con to contribute their expertise and work with Americans to solve the world's problems. Another grand challenge, of course, is the Internet of Things. Some call it the X uh, Internet. Others have other labels. Sensors, cameras, RFID devices, all types of devices working together to monitor the physical world, monitor the environment, improve, improve public safety, monitor the health of the sick and elderly, improve traffic flow, increase, improve, increase crop yields, uh, more effectively deal with disasters, and help us manage the increasing complexity of modern life. Already, as you know, the traffic over the Internet of Things greatly exceeds the traffic over the Internet among uh, people. And again, this is not just a technological problem. We have to find business models to foster cooperation between competing companies. We have to address the very serious privacy and security concerns that arise when each one of us have uh, multiple devices capable of sharing data with the cloud. And as some of you with uh, the higher level security clearances know, we have a kind of ongoing uh, digital Pearl Harbor underway uh, right now, not to hype it in ways that uh, foster false uh, alarm, but uh, we need to understand uh, the, the nature and seriousness of what uh, is now <clears throat> underway, and we need to solve it. These and other grand challenges require cross-disciplinary thinking, people who are double deep, that is, highly trained in information technology as well as their chosen specific field of study. We can't expect our college students to all earn two degrees, so we have to find ways to harness the net and collaborative technology so they can learn faster and learn by doing. The maker movement is a wonderful example of how students of all ages uh, can achieve hands-on learning experiences. So in closing, despite my very serious concerns about the state of the global climate and the evidence that too many governments are unequipped uh, and unable to address uh, these kinds of challenges, at the end of the day, I am an optimist. And to return to one theme I mentioned earlier, I'm optimistic that democracy will begin to work the way it is supposed to as the Internet empowers individuals to become well-informed citizens again and to participate actively uh, in redeeming the promise of self-government. One reason I'm optimistic is that over the last 35 years, I have seen the digital visions of the past realized and much more. As long as we keep making the public and private investments needed, to create new technologies, to educate uh, our people in how to use them effectively, and as long as we keep providing the graduate education to the best technologists, I think we can have reason to hope that we will indeed give our children and grandchildren a better world to live in. It requires exactly the kind of cooperation that occurred between agencies and parties and companies and countries uh, that is exemplified by the NIDR D program. So if this were a formal meal, uh, this is the point where I would say we'll, we all ought to raise our glasses and offer a toast to the NIDR D program. But there isn't any champagne on the table, so maybe we should all just pick up our smartphones instead <laughs> and, and tweet to the continued success of this very important <laughs> Uh, but often overlooked initiative, hashtag at Niter D. Thank you very much. Vice Presidents 
could you possibly imagine who would correctly use the Turing test in a speech? I mean, <laughs> unbelievable. 100-year well, anniversary this year. Yeah. That's right. He's got that one right, too. It's Alan Turing's 100th anniversary in 2012. Mr. Vice President, thank you so much for taking time from an incredibly crazy schedule. He came here, roughly speaking, from Antarctica uh, in order to, uh, to join us today. We have a tiny token to offer you just to remember uh, this event. But once again, we thank you deeply for the time and energy today, but most especially 20 years ago when you started this whole project. Thank you.